The question of the morning is, when was the last time you were at a great dinner party that had any kind of an eternal purpose? Now, we've all been to a lot of dinner parties. And uh, most of them, you get home and you're not sure why you were there. There really wasn't anything meaningful said or done while you were there. But if you've been to a great one, you, you remember it. I, the, the last really great dinner party I was to that had any eternal consequences be three years ago this April when Bob Myers was celebrating his 10th birthday as a believer. And he decided he wanted to get together 20 folks in their little place for dinner. People that had particular influence on his life prior to coming to Christ and after he had come to Christ. And so in their little house, and they just live in a little place, they don't have room to have 20 people for dinner, believe me. And most people wouldn't, because they, well, you can't, there's not enough room, can't do that. But they put the tables in there, cut a candy wapa so everybody could be kind of together. And there were 20 of us around those tables. And after we had dinner, then Bob began to call on people to talk about their affiliation with him in the process of him coming to Christ and after he had come to Christ. And in fact, one of the things that makes that stand out so beautifully, there was only one person there that was not yet a Christian, and that was Norma Cox. Because Sid and Norma played a special part uh, because he was a Timothy that Bob had taken through. And that night I had the privilege to lead Norma to Christ be 10 years ago, or three years ago this coming April. And I, you know, you, that kind of a party stands out. Boy, you don't forget that one. Because it was a big special night to start with. And secondly, when we capped off that evening with someone else coming to Christ out of that group, there's something about new birth that really excites people. I had some of the guys this morning really excited because one of the fellows that was with our group at Dad the Family Shepherd made his commitment to Christ yesterday during the Dad the Family Shepherd get together and shared that with some of our men. That's, that's such a great and beautiful step to be around when that kind of thing happens. So there's a reason to rejoice. It does something for you. And when we get to Mark chapter 14 and see this dinner party and see why it had been called together, it, the, the thing, first of all, is being held at the home of Simon the leper. Now, that's kind of an interesting little nickname. The old three-finger Brown, he used to pitch in the big leagues. They called him that because he had one finger short. You know, back in the old days, everybody had a nickname. I remember all the guys that worked with my dad, they all had nicknames. I'm one great big guy, they all called him Heavy. I never, Heavy Hedrick, that was his name. I'm sure his mama didn't give him that name, but I know that those guys, that was all they ever called him. Another guy was Shorty, another old Slim Birchley. I don't know what Slim's first name was because Slim was all my dad ever called him. And I, these names just happened to come back into my mind. That's been umpty years ago that dad worked with those guys. Everybody had a nickname. And here's old Simon the leper. Now they called him that because he had been a leper. He got leprosy. And you could not get rid of that by going down to the local doctor or buying something at the pharmacy. It had to be some kind of miraculous thing that happened. Then you had to go show yourself to the priest and he had to say, yeah, you're okay. You can get back in the mainstream of society because when you had leprosy, you couldn't just come to church and sit down with the rest of the crowd. The fact is you walked down the street, you had to yell that you were a leper, unclean, unclean as you walked down the street. So everybody would give you a wide berth because they were sure that they rubbed up against you. You'd get it too. It was in the air, man, it was everywhere. And this guy had gone to Jesus and been healed of his leprosy. He'd pretty blamed excited. He'd gotten clearance from the rabbi. He said, let's have a dinner party. I want to have it at my house, but I'm not a good cook, but I know a gal named Martha. You remember Mary and Martha, the uh, sisters of old Lazarus? Martha was a great cook, and he went to Martha and said, Martha, I want to have this dinner party at my house, but I'm not a good cook. You're a good cook. Fix the food and bring it to my house. Now, most women I know don't like to do that. They're going to have a dinner party. They want to have it in their house. So a whole lot easier. But Martha's a great lady. She said, okay, I'll fix the food. Bring it over to your place. 
And they wanted to be there too because see their brother was going to be there. Lazarus, you read about him. This is also in Matthew and in John. I just happen to use the Mark account. In, in, in John, it tells us that Lazarus was there. Well, why was he there? Well, he'd been raised from the dead by Jesus. Now, this is a pretty exclusive dinner party, okay? Uh, you can imagine there are these folks over here that want to talk to old Simon about his leprosy and getting rid of that until they realize Lazarus is there. And then Simon, he didn't have much of a crowd. They're all over there talking. What was it like being dead? Huh? Tell us. Did you see a white light? Huh? All that you read, you know, you read the National Enquirer and tells you all that stuff. You know, ask all those goofy questions about what was it like? And it's really quite a party. And of course, Mary and Martha are there and they're glad to be there because their brother been raised from the dead and, and, and they want to rejoice. But Jesus is the center of this entire thing that is going on. And while this party is going on, disciples are there and other guests are in there. Mary slips out of the room. Verse three during supper and brought in a beautiful flask of expensive perfume and broke the neck on that little cruise of expensive perfume and poured it over Jesus' head and also over his feet and dried his feet with her tears. Now she didn't just put a couple little drops in there. The whole thing. They tell us this is about $400 worth of perfume. And that sounds kind of expensive. That's more than most of you cheap Charlies have ever spent on perfume for your gal. Right? Right? Yeah, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Jeannie. I know I get a word from you. But when you put it into perspective, $400 was the annual wage of a laborer. In one year, he would earn 400 bucks. And here she takes this entire thing and pours it out. Public, extravagant, impulsive act of love centered around Jesus. Now we've heard a lot about love here today. Deborah sang a song for us, said, my Jesus, I love thee. We sang about Jesus and our love for him. See, it's easy to talk about it. We're always mentioning the fact that we love the Lord. But I, I want you to think for a little bit today, when was the last time you did any kind of public, impulsive, extravagant act of love concerning your love for Jesus Christ. Good for you to think on that one a little bit. See, some men are even afraid to say, I love the Lord. That sounds, I don't know. And then some men worry about women who say, I love the Lord. And here's Mary in this open demonstration of her love for the Lord. And immediately, there's a response from that crowd. Look at the waste. She could have sold that and given the money to the poor. Isn't it interesting how easily we talk about other people and how they spend their money? There's kind of a kick. When Schuler was building the Crystal Cathedral, $18 million he spent, there was a cry across this country that was as loud as all get out. Just think what he could do for the poor. Today, they are building churches across this country that make that one seem like nothing from a dollar standpoint. And you're not hearing the same cry. They're not quite as flashy. They don't have the birds flying in and out like he does down there. Ever go to church down there, believe me, wear your hat. Okay? They are literally inside the building. But they're not quite as flashy. And they're not on television talking about it. And the fact that Schuler raised most of that money outside from rich friends of his at a million dollars a crack, you only have to have 18 of them to raise money to build that thing. And he's got them. 
And he's not afraid to go and ask him. Now, as I, I think about all of that kind of notion, how easily we tell people how they should spend their money. They shouldn't be so extravagant. When they're extravagant with us, we kind of get excited, don't we? You know, we say, we mutter, well, you shouldn't have, but we grab the package, huh? <laughs> and right away they're into this. And you know, when you look at the account over in John, who is leading the pack with all of this statement it was worth a fortune, could have been sold, money given to the poor. Judas Iscariot, chapter 12 of John. John makes a little footnote. He says, not that Judas cared for the poor, but he was in charge of the disciples' funds, and he often dipped into them for his own use. Dipped into them. I like that statement, don't you? Just kind of dip a little in there. Of course, he wrote that after Judas was dead. But old Judas, he's upset by what she did. And then Jesus laid out an answer that many folks have misunderstood. Jesus said, let her alone. Why berate her for doing a good thing? See, Jesus wasn't sitting there saying, oh, Mary, you shouldn't do this. Huh? Why are you putting her down for doing a good thing? You always have the poor among you. And a lot of people stop right there and they say, Jesus really wasn't very understanding of the poor. He shouldn't have said that. They don't read the rest of the sentence. You always have the poor with you and they badly need your help. And you can aid them whenever you want to, but I won't be here much longer. When you take the scriptures in the Old Testament especially and, draw, and read all that is said about our responsibility to the poor, it is large. It is a huge responsibility to take care of the poor. Let me read you just a little bit out of Deuteronomy chapter 15. God is saying, if when you arrive in the land the Lord will give you, if there are any among you who are poor, you must not shut up your heart or your hand. See, that's part of what you always have to get people to do. Not just say, oh my, I feel for this person ought to do something. You gotta get your hand going and find your wallet and dig out the money. Don't shut up either your heart or your hand against them. You must lend them as much as they need. Beware, don't refuse a loan because the year of debt cancellation is close at hand. They had a really neat deal back there. Certain years were the year of debt cancellation. Boy, wouldn't that be a winner? Huh? Wouldn't you like to know the year of debt cancellation is coming? And he said, just because that year is coming, don't you decide you're going to not loan. If you refuse to make the loan and the needy man cries out to the Lord, it will be counted against you as a sin. You must lend him what he needs and don't moan about it either. Part of the reason I like the living Bible. Gets right down where we live. We know what a moan is. And we know people who are moaners. You any friends who are moaners? Sure you have. And here he said, don't moan about it, for the Lord will prosper you in everything you do because of this. There will always be some among you who are poor. That's why this commandment is necessary. You must lend to them liberally. I'm going to tell you one of the reasons why we operate a thrift store at Highway City and run an Awana program at Highway City and do a tutoring program at Highway City and do Bible study programs at Highway City because God tells us to care for the poor. Clean out our closets and send all that stuff to Highway City and they sell it out there and no money from out there ever comes to this church. We are the people who take care of making sure that thing keeps going. And a lot of our people give time to go and work in that place simply because they understand God has commanded us to care for the poor. Now some of you haven't gotten that message yet. Some of you don't even clean out your closets and send it out there. Let alone go and work out there four hours a week or whatever. And some of you do, a bunch of you do. And it's a great time. I have the folks that take time out there saying, you know, it's a wonderful place to invest some time. 
Part of the problem is the men who are retired, they think that's women's work out there. And they want all of the women who have time to go out there and work in Highway City. I pray that someday we get a guy, some kind of a real gunner, who will decide he's going to go to work on all the retired men in this church and get them excited about doing something besides just putzing around the house. You can only fix things so long, pal. You know? You've been retired a year or two. You fixed everything there is to fix. And you're in a fix now because you've got nothing left to fix. Okay? And there's an opportunity for you to go out there and serve. A little four-hour shift per week would be a great investment of your time. And you'd get a whole new perspective on life. You would see love in action in that place. Because that's what we're doing out there. You might even decide that you want to help Jack and, and Jim Fifield on that big old white truck that drives around, picks up stuff, and hauls it out there. They keep telling me they're getting tired. I tell them, recruit a little more help. That's part of what I'm trying to help them do here. Recruit a little help. See, the Lord has commanded us to take care of the poor. And we use that for, a, for kind of a hideout sometimes. And Jesus said, here, you always got the poor with you and they badly need your help and you can aid them whenever you can. But I won't be here much longer. She is doing a good thing. She has done what she could. I love that statement. She has done what she could. And has anointed my body ahead of time for burial. And I tell you this in solemn truth, that wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and praised. Isn't that a kick? Here we are almost 2,000 years later, we're talking about this lady doing this thing. Just like Jesus said. And as I think about this extravagant gift of love and think about the setting in which she did this, I have a couple of three questions for you. If you loved yourself as much as Christ loves you, and just think about that for a minute. If you loved yourself as much as Christ loves you, what would you do as a creative expression of love's challenge? What would you do for yourself? See, the Lord tried to teach us and he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Some of us haven't learned that yet. But I'm going to tell you something. I am praying to God that we see some unusual breakthroughs with people in this congregation that look for some fresh new kind of freedom and the flexibility to break out of the tradition, the conservative, the reserved way, and do something that others might call rash in the area of demonstrating love by an investment of time and money and energy. Now, you don't need to look for a dinner party and go in there with a jug of perfume break the neck off, start pouring it on people's feet. I'm not worried about that. You're not going to do that. But what you're trying to do is translate this. You're trying to say, how do I transfer this over and make it work in 1990? You know, Dave Simmons made an interesting observation at Dad the Family Shepherd. He challenged the men to become a part of teaching children in Sunday school in their churches. He didn't know where all we were from. But he said, you man ought to do that. He said, what you ought to do, you ought to start teaching about two years ahead of where your kids are. Then you'll know what to expect when your kids get to that level. That's not bad advice. The only problem with that advice is, is that you guys whose kids are already grown, you say, whoopee, that lets me out. I don't have to teach. And you always look for the loophole. A good salesman looks for a way to seal up the loophole before they start jumping through it. You see, a part of what we need in this day and age 
of so many single parents and so many kids growing up that do not have a dad around, they have no good role model of a man. Somewhere they got to find him. Where are they going to find him? Sunday school is a great place. And some of you guys would be incredibly good at being a part of the teaching staff in the Sunday school at the 8 or 9.30 hour. You can still come to 11 o'clock church. You can go teach at 8, go to class at 9.30 and come here at 11. Some of you are saying, golly, that's a long morning, Pastor. Ain't that bad? You might get excited. Investing yourself in some kid. Just know this, fun for me. Here's Mitch and Rex. I knew these clowns when they were in junior high school. A very exciting thing to watch them grow up and take their place as men with their wives, with their families, with the kind of considerable growth happening spiritually. And that's great fun. If you never invest anything in anybody and watch them grow, it doesn't make any difference. Oh, I knew that kid. That's one thing to say, I knew that kid. It's something else to say, I knew that kid. I was a part of investing in him. And guys, you could do that if the Lord tarries you live long enough. You're going to see some kids you're teaching in the fourth grade. You're going to see them grow up to manhood and you're going to be a key part of their life, a role model they didn't have anywhere else because you gave yourself the extravagant gift of love was in the time you gave to go and teach. Now see, if you're looking for a practical handle on this, there it is. And Mary would just love to have you come and say, Mary, I want to teach. Buf sent me to your office. Mary Van Allsburg is the name. She's head of our children's department. There's a place for you to serve. What's the most extravagant thing you've ever done to recognize your acceptance of the love of Christ into your life? Let me ask that one more time. What's the most extravagant thing you've ever done to recognize your acceptance of the love of Christ into your life? I want to tell you a story. See, I love to tell stories about people that are right here that you know. I hate, in fact, the first book I threw away and I got out of seminary was a story on sermon illustrations. Once upon a time, ba da 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 I want stories of real people, flesh and bone, people we know. And when I ask this last question here, what's the most extravagant thing you've ever done to recognize your acceptance of the Lord Jesus Christ and his love for you that you've shared with somebody else? Recently, at our Rotary Club meeting, Pat Evans came to do makeup. He belongs to the Fresno Club, which is located downtown. And he had missed a meeting. Part of the rules are you do a meeting somewhere. And he came to North Fresno Rotary. And the day that he came, there was a, a fella, a teacher, out of the Fresno Unified School District. They need a little good publicity. So here it is, okay? Here's a teacher, special ed teacher. I've forgotten his name. Special ed. And in his part, in his, in his own time, hobby time, he cares about people who are handicapped. And he has worked a lot with these guys playing this basketball stuff, and now he's working with kids racing, handicapped kids. I mean, this is not like the Special Olympics. You know, Special Olympics, everybody wins. And people, a lot of folks say, well, that's nice. Poor kids, they don't know any different. Yeah, they do. But in this deal, buddy, there's only one first place winner. And he comes, this guy comes to our Rotary Club to talk about this kid, has this kid there in a chair, wheelchair. And this kid is a national champion in his wheelchair racing. So much so that he's been invited to Paris, France early this summer for the world races. I didn't even know they did this stuff, did you? I had no idea. He's going over there and gonna compete with guys from all over the world. And Pat and I, we weren't even sitting together, but I'd seen him across the room and I thought, 
Number one, I thought, I wish our Rotary Club would do something significant. But Rotary is like everything else in this world. It moves with the speed of a snail, you know. And instead of, and I, I want to jump to my feet and say, it's 1,500 lousy bucks, guys. Why don't we send this kid to Paris? Why don't we pay that bill? But I knew they'd say, well, that's, he's always raising money. And uh, they get upset with me anyhow over there. But... Uh, so, so we didn't do anything. But as Pat is walking out, as we leave, I see him hand this man his business card, and he said, uh, call me, I want to get together with you. Now, I don't know how many guys do that when this fellow goes out and speaks. You see, this man represents something that we dare not forget. Most teachers care about kids. Here's a guy who is doing so much on his own time beyond the call of duty to give this kid who is crippled a place. And good things are happening. And so I found out later, I got a hold of Pat and I said, tell me what's going on. And he told me I could tell his story and, then he, and he said, you only tell if you don't tell who did it. And I said, that doesn't make the story work. Okay? He was in the first service. He came and said, I thought I told you, you couldn't tell. And I said, well, you don't lose any of the credit as long as I tell it. If you tell it, then you lose the credit, okay? The guy called Pat, and they got together. And Pat said to him, and this guy, he didn't know anything about fundraising. Pat said, we want to send this kid to France. Guys, wonderful. And Pat said, don't you think you ought to go too? Well, I'm, I'm going to work on that. Pat said, we'll send you too. Oh, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll, I'm going to tell you something. The first rule in fundraising, somebody says they want to give you something, you say, hallelujah, brother. Now, make the check out too, you know. So they're going to send them both. And then they got to, th Pat got to thinking about this thing. You know, one of the guys that Pat and Michelle led to the Lord, Dave Presley. They work for Pat. I always love it when my men are dealing with people who work for them in their spiritual relationship. The only people you're witnessing to is somebody you meet walking down the street or riding an airplane, but never anybody in your circle of friends or in your employee. There's something wrong with your witness. And old Dave Presley He's a guy that got into Timothy and gave his heart to Christ. And he's an old boy. His hair used to hang clear down to his hind end, you know. And, and he's a guy who used to be a motorcycle freak. He'd bring his motorcycle in the living room and work on it. Literally. You've heard about guys like that. This is one that did it. On his back, he has that big tattoo of the Harley Davidson emblem. Just nuts about motorcycles. He used to build motorcycles. And Pat got the wheels to turn and got talking to Dave about these wheelchairs. They're expensive. And the wheelchair companies that build those things will give out the specifications to anybody else as long as they're not building them and selling them for profit. Aha. Uh -huh. Presley is a motorcycle builder. They're in the process of building some racing wheelchairs for other kids who want to do this thing. Isn't that terrific? extravagant and there's a bunch of guys down there at utility trailer who are into a project have no understanding that the thing behind it all is the love of God in Christ Jesus they have no understanding that's what's behind it all back here starting with the boss but they're going to get involved they're going to build some wheelchairs. I'm going to guarantee you something. They're going to be some of those guys that are going to come to know Jesus Christ because of the extravagant gift of getting involved in sending them off to, to Europe to race, of building wheelchairs for them. And that whole thing is going to grow. Okay? Now, you're going to walk out here and say, what am I supposed to do with this? What do I do with this sermon? First of all, you think about what's the most extravagant thing you've ever done 
to recognize your acceptance of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I want you to think about something you ought to do impulsively. To demonstrate that you love the Lord. You see, it, it's good for us to remember that verse 10 says that Judas Iscariot got up from that dinner and left and went to the chief priest to arrange to betray Jesus to them. Boy, here's Mary on the one hand demonstrating incredible love. And this snake is going down the street figuring out a plan of how to betray Jesus. And friend, you're on one side or the other. Make no mistake about it. You either love him or you sell him down the river every day. And I just want you to think about it. your relationship with the Lord and your demonstration of how grateful you are for his love for you. And if we can help you come to Christ, I'm not talking about joining this church. If we can help you come to Christ. There's a rack in front of you. There's a card in it. You can fill it out. It just says, I'm interested in talking to somebody about Jesus. We got boxes around the walls. You can put them in there. We got offering boxes. Put them somewhere. We'll find it and somebody will sit with you this week. Exciting, exciting story. Real life event that took place. I'm going to tell you something. I want my life to demonstrate impulsive, extravagant love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want it for you too. Somewhere you need to start. Maybe the start will be for some of you guys to say, I'm going to get with Mary and I'm going to get signed up, start teaching. I don't know how, but I'm willing to get down on the floor with those kids and do what I need to do as a teacher. That'd be a big step for some of you. I just want you to let the Lord talk to you today and through this week and consider the opportunity you have since you've received the love of Christ, the opportunity to share it. Stand with me, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, it is good to be together. We've had a great time in this place this morning. Marvelous music, great fellowship, and a great time in the Word together. Now help us as we think about some extravagant, impulsive act without concern for what people around us are going to say. Lord, we don't worry about what they're going to say in a lot of other areas in life. Somehow when it comes to Jesus, we get nervous. I'm trusting you for some great things, Lord, as a result of today in this place. And I'm giving you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. God bless you. Good to be with you. Call again.